be doing a live Q&A with Dr. Maya Warren, who is, um, she has a PhD in food science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and she currently works as the Senior Director of International R&D for Coldstone Creamery. So um, her research is in frozen aerated desserts, um, such as ice cream. So um, she will be joining here in a second. Well, hi everyone, thank you all so much again for having me. My name is Dr. Maya Warren. I'm an ice cream scientist. Um, I went to Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota for my Bachelor's of Arts. And then I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison for my PhD. Back, I graduated back in 2015, and my, my degree is in food science, but I specialized in the microstructure, sensorial, and behavioral properties of frozen aerated desserts. So basically anything, everything, ice cream and all of its close cousins, so gelato, frozen yogurt, sorbet, frozen custard, all of that, I literally love ice cream. Like, <laughs> like I'm obsessed with ice cream, like so much that, yes, I eat it a lot. I have some here. <laughs> and... I told myself when I was about 20 to 21, when I was still in college, that I want to do what I love and love what I do for the rest of my life. And to me, going from chemistry into food science is a kind of natural segue a lot of people don't do, but it really does make sense um, because there's so much chemistry involved in food. And from graduation, I took a little bit of time off just to sleep and relax. And then I, um, I've been now with Cold Stone Creamery for about four, four and a half years um, as the head of R&D for the international side of Cold Stone. So I, when we're not in COVID <laughs> times, yep. um, I travel the world and I make ice cream uh, mixes. I do new flavor development, all of that kind of stuff for um, countries literally all, literally all over the world, from Pakistan to Egypt to Thailand um, cool. to Nigeria, you know, all, all of it. So it's, it's yeah. pretty sweet. Yeah. That's awesome. Did you grow up in Minnesota? I did not. I went to... Okay. I, I went to Carleton College in Minnesota, but I'm actually yep. from I'm actually from St. Louis, Missouri. So that's where I was okay. born and raised, and then okay. went went north, and then went a little south to come to Madison. Okay. It was still freezing, but <laughs> yeah. So I live in Minnesota. I didn't. I don't know if you know that, but yeah. I'm oh, I didn't know where you were. Also, awesome. to Northfield, but yeah, I live in Minnesota. So <laughs> when I saw where, that, where about? Um, I live, it, it's a suburb of Minneapolis, kind of southwest of Minneapolis. So yeah, yeah. Awesome. I saw that. I was like, oh, I wonder if she's from Minnesota. <laughs> I'm not, but I know That's a awesome. ton of, I know I have a ton of friends there. Um, actually, one of my yeah. friends is on here, Vanessa. She's from Minnesota, but lives okay. um, out in the Maryland, D.C. area now. But yes, I love Minnesota. Awesome. <laughs> so how did you, did you get into specifically ice cream because you loved ice cream or did the love of ice cream sort of come from you getting into that? Well, actually, so when I was in, um, at Carleton, when I was a senior, I was kind of struggling, you know, what am I going to do with this liberal arts degree, great education, but what am I going to do with it when I graduate? And I had, you know, been pre-med, I'd, you know, done a lot of the shadowing doctors and things like that. And I was an athlete. So I was like, oh, I could become a sports medicine doctor. This will be great. Went to go shadow some doctors again. And I was like, you know, this just doesn't really do it for me. I don't really know. Like mm -hmm. my eyes aren't lighting up. Like I wasn't just super excited about it. Mm -hmm. And so I was actually over my best friend's house. I'm in college at the time and we were watching the Food Network and the show Unwrapped. I'm sure people here know Unwrapped. Oh, yeah. Went yep. in, um, they were are on that episode. They were actually showing how to make uh, different parts of uh, the Thanksgiving meal taste like, have that taste like, soda basically so jones soda the soda comes in a glass bottle oh, yeah yep. yeah so they were making like things they were making like turkey and gravy flavored soda green bean casserole yeah. flavored soda cranberry sauce like not doesn't sound appetizing at all yeah. but i was so infatuated with oh my gosh like i could become a flavor chemist like how cool mm -hmm. is this so Carleton, super small liberal arts school, as you know, doesn't have yep. food science. So I actually mm -hmm. ended up doing a short uh, internship at Malto Mill Cereal Company. Oh, Big, yeah. Big, yep. huge bags of cereal. <laughs> um, I used yeah. to ride my, ride my bike to and from campus um, yeah. down in Northfield and, you know, didn't fall in love with grain and grain science per se, but I fell in love with the science of food. And so during that internship, I actually asked myself, like, Maya, what do you love? And I was like, I really like food science and I love 
ice cream. Like, why shouldn't I just become an expert in something that I love so dearly? And so mm -hmm. I literally went to UW-Madison UW to become an ice cream expert. And I worked under uh, the toolage of Dr. Richard Hartel. Um, okay. And he is a phase transition crystallization expert. And so I did a lot on fat crystallization, ice crystals, of course. Um, and yeah, I just never wanted to not be happy in whatever I do in life. And I mean, thumbs up if ice cream makes you happy. Like I think ice cream pretty much <laughs> makes everyone happy. So yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I actually know a lot of people that worked at Malto Meal too. Because no obviously I live close oh, to yeah, there. But Minnesota. yeah, <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, if you could just kind of go over the basics for everybody, like just really basic, you know, how how ice cream is made. Yes. So pretty, pretty straightforward way of ice cream is made is you need to have, of course, first your legal definition to make sure we meet that. Ice cream has to have 10% or more milk fat. When it comes to ice cream in the United States, we have to have that. So within that definition, milk fat is the pretty much key key phrase there that we have to have that. So you definitely want to have your milk fat source. So whether that comes from cream or milk itself or some variation um, in between. So you have your heavy whipping cream or your heavy cream in, in that. And then you also need to have a sugar source because you need to be able to freeze the product without just the ice becoming a, a block. Um, and so you definitely need to have your sugar source. You need to have a little bit of water in there because that water needs to be able to turn into, of course, ice, uh, mm -hmm. hence the word ice cream. And you also need to be able to have some type of ingredients that can help um, on the grand scale of manufacturing ice cream. You need some type of ingredients that can help um, reduce the ice crystal size or keep the ice crystal size small during storage. So that's like various gums, stabilizers, hydrocolloids. Um, we often will see um, emulsifiers like monodiglyceride are probably sorbet 80 in ice cream, which really help with mouthfeel. Um, they help with the stabilization of air cells and all of that kind of thing. Um, so those that's, that's quite important when it comes to ice cream. And then you need to make sure you have some, some sort of bulking. Maybe it's nonfat dry milk or some, some whey. You can only have but so much whey in there, but something to help increase the total solids. But then you take all of that, you blend all that together, and then you're going to heat it up homogenize it, pasteurize it, cool it. You're going to cool it down to roughly about four degrees uh, C, and then you're going to basically age it. That aging period is basically it's been going into a storage tank, a refrigerated storage tank, where you're basically just turning it, turning it, turning it, allowing those, those hydrocolloids, those emulsifiers to begin to do their job per se, um, so that they can perform the best way they can when it comes to um, doing their job in ice cream. And from there, after it's aged, you're pretty much ready to go and blend it into, make it into actual ice cream. And so you pour that in your freezer, in your batch freezer, in your continuous freezer, and out comes your finished product, whether that takes 10 minutes, whether that takes, you know, 30 seconds, whether that takes mm -hmm. maybe 30 minutes if you're making it at home. It all depends upon kind of what machine you're using. And all of that really does determine the mouthfeel, how much ice, how large your ice crystals are gonna be in your ice cream. For instance, you can take the exact same ice cream mix made the exact same way, put it in two different machines, and output will be totally different because your resonance time, so your time that it takes to actually freeze the ice cream, literally makes such a huge difference in the texture because of the, ice, the large ice crystals that grow when or that, that form when you're cooling when you're freezing slower versus when you're freezing faster, like liquid nitrogen ice, ice cream, you mm -hmm. don't feel hardly any ice crystals. It's just cold. Right. Yeah. So is that why, like when you make it at home, obviously it has a different texture than when you're buying it from the store. Um, yes. Is that because like our freezers are freezing it over a longer period of time? So those ice crystals end up being larger? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. So, so okay. when, it comes, when it comes to making ice cream at home, one of the key things is being able to have as little water in there as possible <laughs> um, okay. because the longer it takes for the ice cream to freeze in your like a Cuisinart or, you know, any kind of home ice cream machine, the longer it takes literally to freeze the product, the larger the ice crystals can become. The freezing always starts from the outside in, you know, whether it's, you know, some type of refrigerant on the outside of your barrel, if you're using a, a you know, big ice cream machine, or if you're at home and you're using, you know, a, bear, a container that you put into the freezer and then took it out, 
regardless, yeah. it's a scraped surface heat exchanger. So it's scraping mm -hmm. the surface of that, of that, the dasher is scraping the surface of the, the barrel, the outside, the, the inside of the freezer where all the ice is forming. That mm -hmm. ice then becomes that, what that dasher does is it, it, it spins, it, it whips the ice cream. Um, but the, ice crystals begin to get shaved off with each turn of the dasher. Those ice crystals then begin to go to the center of the ice cream, where it's actually okay. a little bit warmer per se mm -hmm. than the outside of than the what's closer to the barrel. And yep. with that itself, you end up with smaller ice crystals in the center, but the longer it takes to freeze, the larger those yeah. ice crystals will become over time. So right. ideally at home, you want to be able to have as less water as possible. I mean, I'm actually having ice cream that I made here. Um, but I actually don't use an ice cream machine at home, really. I just make it with heavy whipping cream, condensed milk, evaporated milk. And I just whip okay. it to, be, to form my foam. Because ice cream, you want to make sure you have air in it. Air makes it scoopable. It makes it so it kind of melts in your mouth a certain way. So air is very, very, very important. And okay. I don't want too much water. And I want air. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you've been doing some um, videos, I think, every Sunday um, on your page, too, for people to make it along with you. So if you're interested in yes. doing that, check out, check out Maya's page. Um, she has some pretty cool videos of if you want to try to make your own ice cream at home. So yes, thank yeah, you. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, I know I had a few people ask this question. And I had the same question. So when you buy ice cream from the store and you have it in your freezer for a while, it always <laughs> seems like a different texture, you know, day yeah. one versus even, you know, a couple days later to a week later. So what's going on? Like, why does it change texture just sitting in your freezer? Yes. So there's a lot of things that happen with ice cream. Um, if you have a pint of ice cream and you take it out and you're eating out of the pint, your mouth is a lot warmer and that metal spoon and or plastic spoon gets warm and you stick it back into a pint of ice cream that's cold. You're then mm -hmm. melting those ice crystals. Yep. And then that free water that's there, if you don't scoop it up and eat it, that free water then, when you put it back in your freezer, that free water then begins to latch on to smaller ice crystals that might still be there and then form mm -hmm. larger ice crystals. So there's never okay. new ice crystals that get in there. It's just yeah. free water that's melted. And okay. then because you're scooping, you're scooping, you end up collapsing the ice cream just a bit and that air is so key in terms of the mouth the mouth feel the scoopability of it. it it's it's never quite the same and then with all the hydrocolloids that are in some ice cream and maybe corn mm -hmm. syrup and things like that once that water starts to melt starts up the ice starts to melt into water and that water mm -hmm. kind of has free range to roam it really starts affecting those other ingredients which then in mm -hmm. turn affect the way that we're going to actually perceive it sensorially. So what I like to say to people is take your pint of ice cream, get some scoops and put it right back in the freezer or just literally eat the whole pint and work out <laughs> later. <laughs> That's good advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. As far as like the inclusions go to in the, in the ice cream, somebody had asked, um, you know, like if you're putting pieces of cookie in there, are they different from just typical like Oreos that you buy at the store, you know, to make it so they don't get soggy or like, I know as far as like chocolate pieces go, um, you know, the melt point is going to be different than like mm -hmm. a chocolate that you're going to put in a cookie at home because obviously like your mouth is cold while you're eating the ice cream and you don't right. want a chocolate chip that's not going to melt. So right. can you just kind of talk about the inclusions and kind of how like, cookie pieces, for example, are they different or are they just regular Oreo pieces that go in there? Or is there something that's coating them? Um, how does that work and how does it affect like the end product? Great question. Um, so I'll start, since you mentioned Oreo, I'll start with Oreo, which is actually what I have here. I'm obsessed with cookies and cream. And when it comes to, when it comes to Oreos and ice cream um, or, you know, a cookie sandwich of that nature, believe it or not, it's pretty much the same thing. Because when we eat cookies and cream, we want a soft cookie. We, mm -hmm. we want it to be kind of almost dissolvable with the ice cream itself and, and things like that. So mm -hmm. that's a little different than if you were to put brownie in the ice cream. Right. If you have brownie, like a cake piece, 
You want that mm-hmm. to have some type of a lot lower, lower moisture than what you would make, what you would bake at home. And those are mm-hmm. usually maybe covered in a little bit of starch or something to kind of help with that water migration. Because what you don't want to happen is you put in, let's say, uh, cereal. Let's just say mm-hmm. like, like Rice Krispie or Frosted Flakes. You put that in your ice cream. You put that in the freezer. You, you take it out and you're like, hey, when I put it in here, it was crispy and now it's so soggy. Like, why did that happen? Mm-hmm. Those yep. cereal pieces don't have that oil, that oil barrier. So okay. the, 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 the interface of a fat and water, we all know that fat and water don't, don't, don't mix on, it, on their own. Yep. So it's, a, it's the same thing, that, that oil that's there, that could be there on some of those inclusions can help mm-hmm can help uh, hinder that water from migrating in. But when you don't have, when you don't, literally when you don't have that barrier, you end up with that water migration, which can turn into a soggy piece. But also a lot of it has to do with, you know, how much water content is in that product as well, because you don't want it to become too icy. You know, all of that has a, plays a huge part. So the inclusions that you see in your ice cream, like if you go and get Haagen-Dazs or Ben and Jerry's or, you know, anything Mm -hmm. like that, it's going to be different than maybe what you just make at home. Right. Except for some of the cookies that you want to be softer in the product anyway. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, People are hungry, eat ice cream. (laughs) (laughs) Can you kind of talk about, I know you kind of talked about it already, but Mm -hmm. just the different um, additives that people might see on a label. And I know a lot of times, you know, people don't necessarily like to see things that they they might not be able to pronounce or might not be able to understand. So could you just kind of talk about like typical additives that you might see on a package and you know, really what they're there for. Um, I think a lot of times people just think, you know, food scientists are just adding these things for no reason. (laughs) And um, yeah, (laughs) it'd be nice to just, you know, kind of explain like what the reasoning is behind those being in there. Sure. So on your typical ice cream label, you'll most likely, especially if it's a big mass production of ice cream that needs to travel through the U.S., maybe even travel overseas, you'll end up seeing things um, that I mentioned earlier, such as the stabilizers um, Mm -hmm. that maybe are locust bean gum, guar gum. uh, uh, A lot of people are using um, tapioca starch now. Um, You probably don't really see gelatin anymore. Mm -hmm. That was old school, old school (laughs) ice cream making. Um, And maybe you'll see carrageenan here and there. Um, Maybe xanthan gum. It just depends. You'll see. You'll see a range, um, kind of a mm-hmm. cocktail of them that you know suppliers provide to the ice cream industry. And the importance of them is is it's pretty simple and kind of what I talked about earlier. It's all about mouthfeel and it's all about hindering the growth of those ice crystals. Mm-hmm. Show of hands, who wants icy ice cream? Hopefully, <laughs> no one. Hopefully, no <laughs> one says yes. In the ice cream industry, we work very, 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 very hard not to have icy ice cream. And those particular ingredients help, help keep the ice cream as smooth as possible. There's a little, other factors that go along with it as well, but that's their role. They also provide stability. Um, that stability is key, especially um, when you're trying to make sure that the air stays in the container of ice cream when you're mm-hmm. shipping it from New York to Colorado. And the emulsifiers, like um, there's emulsifiers like soy leth- lecithin, which are, which are opportunity to use, but they don't necessarily work as good or as the perform as well as um, polysorbate 80 or monodiglyceride, which are very key in ice cream because a little bit of polysorbate 80 can go a very long way in something that we call destabilizing the fat globules themselves. And that fat destabilization is everything when it comes to ice cream. Why, you might ask? It's <laughs> all about creaminess. Creaminess in ice cream, it's, it's one of the reasons why, we, why we're like drawn to it so much is because ice cream is creamy. So mm-hmm. that fat destabilization that the emulsifiers help do is so critical. So if you want a creamy ice cream, having that in there actually does help. And it's in such minute amounts. I think someone uh, made a comment on there about, you know, it's kind of small amounts. It's not necessarily unhealthy or anything like that. It's in such small amounts that you don't even know it's in there, but they're in there for for functional reasons. And I actually just wanted to show 
This is an image in case anyone's ever wanted to see fat globules under a microscope. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is what I was talking about, partially coalesced fat. So it's all this, all the fat globules are sort of clustered together, but that's what we attribute to that creaminess in ice cream. Okay. Um, I know I had some people ask this question too. So when you have ice cream that's lower fat or fat free, um, how are you adding that creaminess back if there's less fat in it? Or I guess, I don't know if there is actually fat free ice cream, but um, yeah, <laughs> how are you adding that, um, that texture back to those types of ice cream? So you can add texture back to ice cream in a few different ways. You can do it processing, process-wise, where maybe you start freezing the ice cream. Um, its draw temperature is lower than your typical draw temperature would be. So um, in ice cream, I work in Celsius, so sorry. <laughs> but in its, um, your draw temperature should be around, basically around negative 6 Celsius. So if you can okay. get that draw temperature maybe to around minus – seven minus 7.5 you can have even smaller ice crystals which can help um that the iciness that can come also those stabilizers play a huge role there's a lot of research mm -hmm. that goes on in terms of mouthfeel of stabilizers will they mm -hmm. attribute to a gumminess at a certain level will it be kind of a slimy or a silky kind of attribute so those play a huge huge role so processing ingredient and there's also um fat filler, not, not a filler, but like a, like a replacer that can help, mm -hmm. again, bulk up your product without having to have fat actually involved. Um, if it's, it's a little hard to mimic, but people have done it. And also mm -hmm. air plays a crucial role because if you can stabilize the product with enough air, you'll kind of get that sensation of it feels like regular ice cream because the air is doing its role as well. Um, okay. so yeah, I hope, I hope that, that, yeah, 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 that explains okay. it. Yeah. Um, I think too, I think somebody had asked, well, let me just see if there's any questions on here. Um, there was something about oh, haagen -Dazs. So, Why does haagen -Dazs have so few ingredients? Yeah. So I know there's a lot of those like natural brands now that mm -hmm. kind of tout having like only four or five ingredients. Um, so in doing that, you know, you typically don't see any gums or any of those, uh, ingredients on the label. So are those just going to be less creamy or it, you know, is there another way that they're, they're doing that? Um, I just want to make sure too, that I specify that these natural, you know, just because it's called natural, it doesn't mean that it's <laughs> healthier or safer. Um, you know, a lot yes. of people <laughs> like those five ingredient things, but it's, it doesn't, you know, natural in the food world doesn't really mean anything. So a lot of yeah. that is marketing. Um, <laughs> But yeah, how are they, how are they able to do that and still get, you know, the same creaminess or are those typically just not as creamy? So when it comes to certain products in the ice cream industry, as I mentioned earlier, you have to have 10% or more milk fat to be called ice cream. Mm -hmm. So there are ice creams out there in the industry that are 10%. That's where they, that's where they sit. And there's also ones that are 14 to 15% milk fat. That's a big difference when it comes to um, the, the, the fat level, that, that four to maybe 5% difference, that's big. And so what actually ends up happening um, for a brand like haagen -Dazs, they actually use egg yolk in their product. So okay. egg yolk is also can be used as an emulsifier. It's, it's a lot more expensive though. So that's why you don't yep. see it everywhere because of the price. But right. it's not a custard. Custard, by legal definition, has, one point, has to have 1.4% or more egg yolk in it. So haagen okay. usage of egg yolk is low enough, but yet still high enough that it gives them the texture that they're looking for. Okay. So along with a, with a lot higher fat that they're using, that egg yolk, they're able to keep their ice crystals rather small. They have extremely low overrun. haagen overrun is around like 27 percent and that overrun is uh, the amount of air that's in the product so if you ever go to the grocery store and you're holding a pint of haagen -Dazs and you're holding a pint of like edies or dryers and you oh which one is heavier the haagen -Dazs is going to be a way heavier so that the the, okay. la the lack of air and the high solids is what helps haagen -Dazs be able to stay haagen -Dazs. If, okay. if, if that makes sense. But haagen yeah. when, when you yeah. when you look at haagen for instance, under the microscope, it's partial coalescence that, that um, 
agglomeration of fat globules is almost um, very little compared to other brands. But they get okay. their creaminess attribute by using high fat and by having very low overrun and making it as smooth as possible when you actually consume it. So okay. there's a lot of science. I mean, I know it's crazy. It's like, oh, my God, you literally went to school to become an ice cream <laughs> scientist? Like, I went in the world. But I promise you there's so much science in ice cream. I know. Cream. It's crazy. Like, just a lot of things, you know, in the food industry. And obviously, I don't have my PhD, but I worked at a, you know, a small popcorn company for a while. And, you know, everybody was just like, popcorn, how complicated can it be? And <laughs> it's like, it's crazy how complicated it's like, so complicated can be <laughs> and like how much science goes into when you go to the store and you buy something and you eat it you just don't even really think of all of that stuff that goes into it and all of the thought that gets put behind yeah like the mouth feel the taste all that kind of stuff so it's insane but yeah yes. I didn't even know there was this much behind ice cream it's crazy <laughs> yes I mean ice cream is such a fascinating product I think because ice cream believe it or not is actually um Sorry, I want to be able to show you this. Ice cream itself has three different phases. So it's a gas, a liquid, and a solid. So that's the beauty of mm -hmm. ice cream, and that's also one of the difficulties of it. So here I'm showing you all um, air cells inside of ice cream. So this is what air cells look like under the microscope. So this is the gas phase. And then here is the solid phase. This is the um, ice crystals under the microscope. So this is what they look like. They can be very large or very small, just depends upon <laughs> the ice cream product itself. And then of course, the fat that I showed earlier is actually partially crystalline and partially liquid. And then there's this serum phase in ice cream. And so when it comes to making ice cream and the science behind it, people are looking at all three or four of them, if you include the serum phase as well, they're looking at all of those to try to mm -hmm. see, okay, what is a customer going to be drawn to? What are they going to like? How can we make it maybe so it doesn't melt as fast or it's healthier, or there's lower fat or, you know, more protein, mm -hmm. like whatever the whole, you know, goal might be. But those, that's the main bulk of what we look at when it comes to ice cream itself. Yeah, um, I think you kind of touched on this already. Mm -hmm. Well, you talked about custard. Um, so what are the differences between custard, soft serve, gelato, ice cream? I don't even know whatever else there is. What are the differences? All the frozen <laughs> aerated desserts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this is actually one of my favorite questions to answer because everyone knows what we're talking about when we talk about these products for the most part. So mm -hmm. let's start with ice cream. In the, in the U.S., we, again, we have that legal definition. To sum it up, make it as easy as possible, has to have 10% or more milk fat, cannot have more than 100% overrun, which again is that volume expansion the air and ice cream. So that's ice cream. Custard, we have a legal definition too for frozen custard, can't, has to have more than 1.4% or 1.4% egg yolk or more. When it comes to um, soft serve, soft serve, believe it or not, is actually a term that describes the product itself. It's served soft. So getting a cone that we call soft serve, it's not mm -hmm. actually... Like it's, it's maybe milk ice or ice milk, or maybe it's even ice cream, but it's the soft serve is literally the way it's served, meaning it's served okay. soft. Okay. Um, when it comes to gelato in the U.S., we actually do not have a legal definition of gelato. Oh, Italians, on I the other hand, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if you go to the store right now, you'll see gelato from Talenti, which is, yep. un, which is un, Unilever. You'll also mm -hmm. see gelato from Breyers. Um, and you'll maybe see some other gelato out there. They're uh, all yeah. extremely different. Okay. Very, very different because we don't have a legal definition. Yeah. Italians will, will have their own definition and I can yep. get into that. But typically when it comes to gelato, what you'll see if you're going to like a real gelato shop is you'll see a product that is typically made very, very, very fresh typically that day or maybe the night before, but it's not really made and then sad and, you know, distributed mm -hmm. all around. It's kind of made fresh at the store and then served. The other thing with gelato, it tends to have less air than your typical ice cream. So maybe typical ice cream has about, I don't know, somewhere between 60, 70% um, air added to it. 
But when it mm -hmm. comes to, and that's typical, that's not like your very high end, that's kind of your middle range, whatever kind of ice cream. But when it yeah. comes to gelato, you'll have a much lower amount of actual air added to the product. And you'll also end up with a little bit of a sweeter product. It's actually, mm -hmm. um, when you, fr it has higher total solids, it has a bit, a bit more sugar in it. And it's actually typically served a little bit warmer. If you notice at gelato shops, they don't use, um, they're, they're, they don't use ice cream scoops. They use kind of like a paddle or like a spatula. That's, yep. because, that's because it's of how soft it actually is at the serving temperature. So a lot of okay. differences with that. We'll also see a lot of gelato very, 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 very fruit forward. Um, mm -hmm. But again, gelato can be sorbet, how we look at sorbet. Gelato could also be how we look at ice cream. Or it could mm -hmm. be how we look at low-fat ice cream or reduced-fat ice cream. It kind of runs the gamut. Um, yeah. And then when it comes to sherbet, of course, sherbet is low-fat ice cream with, like, sorbet combined with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes to, to sorbet, of course, no dairy added. Um, and then we have the whole line of no sugar added products. We have um, everything from high protein products to non-dairy mm -hmm. to vegan to dairy free. I mean, you name it, it is yeah. there. <laughs> How are those ones formulated that are, um, you know, using sugar substitutes versus sugar? Because obviously, I mean, I've formulated not not dairy products or ice cream, but just, you know, in general, when you when you're replacing sugar with a high intensity sweetener, it's so much less volume. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, how is that done in ice cream? So when it comes to ice cream, you won't, right now, you usually don't see so many of those high intensity sweeteners as you might have used to see. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people are using sugar alcohols right now um, yep. to be able to mimic sugar the best way you can. Um, the yeah. importance of sugar for everyone who doesn't know is to be able to, of course, provide that sweetness that we love, but functionality wise, it's really to help with texture and to get the freezing point depression where it should be so that when you're freezing your product, it doesn't become a block of ice. It actually becomes ice cream. And so mm -hmm. trying to mimic, trying to get something that literally mimics sugar taste and functionality wise it's quite difficult. So they're using sugar alcohols to be able to do that. But in doing that, you'll end up getting a slight different taste. I don't know. I don't know if everyone can tell. I mean, I've mm -hmm. been doing this now for, I don't know, a bit over 10 years. So I definitely know when I, when I, you know, when I eat stuff. Um, yeah. But you'll, you'll notice the difference. But the, but the reason why they're doing that, is, doing that is because they don't want to add sugars. Then it goes all the way back to the stabilizers that we talked about earlier. Um, maybe or maybe not they're using the emulsifiers. It just depends. Um, mm -hmm. And then it also goes to what kind of fat source are they using? A lot of non-dairy places are using coconut um, fat. Maybe it's deodorized uh, to not have that coconut flavor. Some places mm -hmm. are using various different kinds of oils. But if you notice, if you have some ice creams that tend to be really, really, really hard and a bit icy in your, you know, mm -hmm. when you're trying to eat that non-dairy or that, you know, vegan ice cream, it's because that fat that they're using does not provide that stability that milk fat or coconut fat can provide. Coconut fat is so beautiful in ice cream because it actually mimics milk fat extremely well. Looking at okay. it under the microscope, it forms those partially coalesced fat globules that I mentioned earlier, which is mm -hmm. so cool, but not mm -hmm. every fat will do that. A fat like canola right. oil, which is liquid, <laughs> and yep. it does, I mean, I don't know what temperature you have to get it to to freeze, but you got to get yeah. it pretty low. <laughs> yeah. So um, within that, you can't use that oil to get to the exact same product as your ice cream. So you end up with right. people trying a lot of different things um, to yeah. be able to hopefully get to the end goal that is suitable for the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, we had a question that said, mm -hmm. geared towards R&D... What is the industry preferred sensory evaluation method for ice cream um, slash frozen aerated desserts? Um, are they meaning um, like triangle test or in terms of just I'm consumer? not really sure. <laughs> Can you kind of just talk about maybe, I guess, um, as far as like, you know, product development, I, I guess just like how wherever, you know, wherever you do your you know, you create a product and then I guess, how does it go from that to 
the store or, yeah. you know, like what are the steps kind of in between there? Um, you know, you think you have a product to like getting it. And obviously I, I get it's probably different at every company, but right. I'll do generalizing. Like where, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in, in general, you, you, of course, conceptualize an, an idea um, yes, like triangle, duo, trio, et cetera. Um, sorry, the, the person um, indicated what they were looking for in that question. So I'll briefly answer yeah. that and then I'll come back to your, to the, uh, to the okay. other question. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to industry, it all depends upon what you're looking for. If you're changing an ingredient, then you're going to use a different test than if you're looking at a completely new product. So it all depends upon what your ultimate goal is. If you're looking at a sugar replacement and you're just trying to see is if there's a difference between the two versus if you're looking at a whole new product that maybe is a new frozen aerated dessert, you're going to use a much different sensory method. So it all depends upon your target that you're looking for within that, um, within that analysis that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but then it, when it comes to actual product development, R&D itself, when we're looking at um, in general within the industry, when you're like, oh, OK, how can I make this new flavor or this new product? It's, mm -hmm. you know, comes down to doing a lot of work with marketing. I mean, a yep. ton of work with marketing because, <laughs> um, <Yep. laughs> I mean, that the marketing is what really helps determine if a product is going to be able to move forward or not. And so that makes a huge difference. So you're going to work with marketing. Um, maybe they bring you ideas or you bring them ideas and say, hey, you know, we could do this. Or they say, hey, do this. And you're like, um, I don't think this can be done in, tw in two months. And they're like, why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, do you, do you don't know if you know what goes into it, but it's a lot yep. of, yeah. So if, if any food scientists or scientists are on here right now, you all definitely get why we're laughing because yeah. it happens to all of us. Oh yeah, um, definitely. But in the, in terms of ice cream, what I like to do personally is I do go to fine dining restaurants pre COVID Go to fine dining restaurants, go to a lot of food shows, trade shows. I travel a lot for, for my job. I travel internationally. So I go to all kinds of countries and gather ideas of, you know, what could America be ready for? You know what I, you know what I mean? Like, like what? Yep. Maybe it's too soon. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not the right time. Maybe yeah. it's just too different. Um, and then yep. it's a lot of trial and error, a ton of trial and error. You're like, all right, let me see if this will work. Uh, mm -hmm. this just didn't quite hit the mark. Let me see if this will work. And then it's a team of people that come together along with marketing and sales and, you know, whoever, whoever else distribution purchasing to make sure we can get the ingredients and all of that to then say, mm -hmm. Hey, yeah, we want to move forward with this product. Um, but there's a lot of sensor sensorial aspects that go involved from different people, taste testing to getting kids to taste test if it's a kid forward product. Um, mm -hmm. and it, you can have an idea that literally could go from, um, idea to actual in store it could take a year it could take I don't know I mean it could take six months if you're really fast and it doesn't take that many new ingredients it just depends upon what it actually is that you're doing um, right. but sensory aspect of, of the whole process is really fun because you can really see how when people taste products how much they enjoy it you know mm -hmm. all, all of that kind of stuff um, yeah. but one product that I actually made um, about two years ago it just came out last year for Cold Stone um, is a honey cornbread and blackberry jam ice cream and so oh, wow. I was yeah and I was that's awesome I was when I was making it I was you know in the lab and I was like you know what could people be drawn to that they understand, but yet maybe haven't eaten it this way? And I was like, people love cornbread. It's American, you know, Thanksgiving time, you know, that kind of thing. And I yeah. was like, people eat cornbread kind of in a sweet or in a savory way. So mm -hmm. how, how could we make this work? And so ended up doing a few different runs of it, had people taste it, just like blind tasting. What do you think? How is it? And I loved it because it used real cornbread and you get that grittiness from the cornbread in it. Some people didn't yeah. care for it. I was really drawn to it. But, yeah. you know, kind of taking, all right, could a, would America be ready for this kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And saying, you know what? Yeah, I think so. And so we put it, we launched it, we put it out and people, people really liked it. So it was really just a kind of a cool product to be able to say like, hey, I made this and most people liked yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So since you do, you know, you said you do, um, you know, international work. And so are you see like, are you creating, um, you know, different flavors for different countries that like, mm -hmm. you know, like, have you ever tried 
something that was like, you know, really popular in one country and like tried it in the US and, and like <laughs> no one liked it. <laughs> yes, yes, believe you me. Um, there are just things that I tried other countries that I just don't bring back because I already yeah. know that it's not going to hit the mass market here. Um, right. For instance, in Taiwan, tea, it, I mean, it's, it's tea haven. I mean, tea's everywhere in Taiwan. Yeah. And they have such amazing tea flavors and tea ice cream flavors, all of that. But it just, on the mass U.S. market, it would not go as well as it does in, in Taiwan. You know what I mean? Like, it's, yeah. it's just, it's yeah. just different. Um, yeah. It, it's it's just a different way of how we consume products and you know right. in some in some countries you know cold stone here or in even just in general we love cake batter like mm -hmm. you make you make the batter of a cake and you lick the bowl you know that that kind of yep. thing i mean don't don't do it raw eggs i know don't, <laughs> don't do it but when we were kids we all did it yeah um, and so but but that that flavor to people to some people in international countries is so foreign and they're like why would you ever eat that you know what i mean so yeah it, it, go, it yep. goes both ways but i think what we're going to start seeing as time goes on is more and more and more of those flavors that continue to cross over. We've been seeing it for quite some time, ube and taro and things like that. But we'll yep. continue to see more and more, more and more of those flavors that cross over. But I don't really think that we'll see a black sesame ice cream on a huge scale here right. in the next yeah. year or so, but yeah. it does quite well in, in other markets. So yeah, that's yeah. cool. Um, somebody had a question. I think it's kind <laughs> of a it seems like a general question about flavors, but in the sense of s smell, um, how does that factor in when evaluating products um, as far as like, you know, if you're smelling something, how does that affect how it tastes and kind of vice versa? It has a humongous effect on how it tastes. So if you're sick and you have a stuffy nose or sinus infection, whatever it might be, and you're mm -hmm. eating and you're like, oh, I can't taste anything. Well, you, you, you actually can still taste. Mm -hmm. Your taste buds haven't left. So the salt, the salty, you know, sweet, sour, bitter, umami, all of that, it's still there. But what we can't do is we can't smell. So that olfactory system, the system that connects our nose with our, with our mouth, is so critical. So if you ever plug your nose and say you're eating, um, I don't know, maybe like peanut butter ice cream or something like that, you plug your nose, you make it salty and sweet out of it, and then you open your nose, and you mm -hmm. can then tell that it's peanut butter. Because the olfactory system is such an integral part of how we consume food. Our eyes right. are a huge part of how we consume food too, honestly. Yeah. We eat with our eyes first and foremost, regardless. So yeah. making sure the food looks the way it should look. So if you're giving me, I think back in the day, Heinz did a ketchup thing where they had like purple or green colored ketchup and thinking yeah. kids would love it. But I think like kids yeah. were like, no, like ketchup is not supposed to look like this. Yeah. So again, we, we eat with our eyes and then you right. want your food to smell a certain way because when you're eating it, that smell is what continues to draw us in, but that sweet, salty, bitter, sour umami, all of those real tastes and not necessarily flavors, but those tastes are what keeps it balanced and keeps us wanting more. Like the other day yeah. on um, Ice Cream Sundays with Dr. Maya, I made a um, chocolate ice cream with peanut butter and Reese's. And I am not a, the biggest chocolate ice cream fan, but I love combining that sweet, salty with the peanut butter with the ice cream because I'm, yeah. I'm drawn to that taste-wise. But if mm -hmm. I plug my nose and I just end up with something cold that's sweet and salty, I don't know if I would like it as much as that, right. as my olfactory system allows me to when I'm actually consuming it normally. Yeah, yep. Um, I'm just going to look through the... I had a huge list of questions that people had okay, asked. Yeah. I think we got through a lot of them, but I just want to make sure. Uh -huh. um, oh, somebody asked if employees get to eat reject ice cream. 100% <laughs> yes. I think no matter where you work in the food industry, you probably yeah. get to eat rejected whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get to um, eat a lot of um, good stuff and not yeah. so good stuff sometimes too. <laughs> oh yeah. So what is the, what is the worst or like one of the, like the worst combinations that somebody has developed or yeah. Oh geez. I mean, one time um, 
and this is, you know, take it how you, how you will. Different people like different things, but just not my cup of tea. Um, a chicken and waffle flavored ice cream um, that used literally chicken stock. Oh, yeah. Redu- like reduced chicken <laughs> stock. Mm, I like sweet salty, but not that kind of sweet salty. Yeah, that doesn't sound very good. <laughs> um, not, uh, yeah. I also had ketchup ice cream when I was in Canada one time. Oh, I've actually uh, heard of that. I've never tried it, though. That doesn't is, sound good, though. <laughs> it's, I, it's just not. Like, I don't know yeah. how to go about it. Like, I'm sorry. It's, it's beautiful looking because it's so yeah. red. But yeah. I did not care for that at all. Um, yeah, that doesn't sound that great. <laughs> yeah. But I've had things um, like, a, like a Thai curry ice cream that okay. uses like a curry paste that you could buy from the store that they're, yeah. you know, put into the ice cream. It was, it was interesting. It, it could have been good, but it just wasn't quite balanced the way I wish it was. I've had yeah. Dorito ice cream that they literally used crushed up Doritos. <laughs> The Doritos were soggy yeah. again. Oil migration that we talked about earlier. Yeah, um, yeah. I just don't think Doritos belong in ice cream, but that's just me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that I don't personally like that are out there, but that's the beauty yeah. of ice cream. Like people often ask me, you know, Maya, what's the best ice cream or the best ice cream flavor? I tell people it's very personal. I mean. There's a reason why there's so many ice cream brands and so many ice cream companies that exist is because mm-hmm. every individuals like different things. Some people like higher overrun and maybe a lower fat. Some people like lower overrun and a higher fat or, you know, it just depends upon the texture that they're looking for, all of that stuff. Um, yeah. So, yeah, but I make a beet ice cream, though, with goat cheese and pistachios and salt and pepper. Oh, that actually honey. sounds really good. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. I should do it one day on the Sunday good. thing. I should do it. It's really yeah. good. Really good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just remembered a question. Um, somebody had asked, what was it? What are, what are the no churn ice creams? You see that on the label sometimes. Like, what does that mean? So is it no churn or slow churn? I don't, they said no churn, but it okay. might be, it might be slow churn. Yeah. Okay. Like, what does that even mean? So no churn. So I'll start with no churn first since that's what they said. And then I'll go into slow churn. Yeah. yeah. So, so no churn itself um, is actually what I do on Sundays. So instead of having to use an ice cream machine, because everyone's not quite as crazy obsessed with ice cream as I am and doesn't, doesn't necessarily have three ice cream machines sitting in their apartment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I realize that people want to make ice cream at home right now and they don't, they don't have access to a machine. So I've been doing, um, no churn where you take heavy whipping cream and you take a hand mixer or kind of a kitchen tabletop mixer and you're whipping that to create your air, your air and your body. Mm -hmm. And then you're using condensed milk, evaporated milk, you're flavoring um, cocoa powder, peanut butter, whatever it is that you want to add to it to make your ice cream. And then you're putting it in the freezer, getting it out the next day or maybe six hours later and you're eating it. It's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's not quite how we would think of ice cream and the shelf life of it is not nearly what you would want it to be when it comes to large yeah. production of ice cream. But in terms of being able to make something yourself at home, it's absolutely delicious. I mean, it's basically, it's what I just literally ate here. <laughs> um, is no churn, no, no churn cookies and cream ice cream. And so going to the slow churn, I think um, Edie's slash dryers has that slow churn um, ice yeah. cream. It's actually um, half the fat of regular Edie's ice cream. So if Edie's is roughly around 10 to 12% fat, it's somewhere between five and 6% for the slow churn. Also the process in which they freeze that product is different than how you would freeze regular Edie's ice cream. So when they're extruding it, or sorry, when it's it's exiting the freezer, it's actually exiting the freezer at a much lower temperature. The ice crystals inside of that slow churn ice cream are let's just say maybe 20 to 20 to 30 microns smaller than the ice okay. crystals that are inside the other, the other ice cream. Um, okay. Air wise. I don't remember with the slow churn, what the air is like, but I know that sometimes with the slow churn, they might f- start freezing it and then they'll recirculate frozen product to help what's being to help the liquid product start freezing faster so that when it exit it exits, the ice crystals are, are smaller. Okay. A lot of engineering okay. um, goes, yeah, goes yeah. into stuff like that, but it's actually a really cool yeah. process. Yeah. And then, um, I don't know if you talked about this already, but the, the, I know like there's like 
premium and there's labels like that. Do those, do those mean much in terms, did you already explain kind of what the premium means or, um, I don't know what the other labels are, but I think yeah. I've seen something like that on there. Oh yeah. There's a trillion different labels in the ice cream yeah. world. <laughs> yeah. Um, but when it comes to like your normal ice cream, again, 10% or more milk fat, I don't think anyone on here will ever forget that because I've said it about 10 times now. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, my friend Essie from Nigeria is on. Hi, Essie. Um, <laughs> so you'll have your, um, we'll start, we'll start at the highest level. So you'll have your yep. super premium ice cream. Your super premium ice cream typically will have low over them with super high fat. So maybe yep. it's somewhere between like, kind of like haagen So you have like your 27, yep. 30% air and you have like your 14, 15% fat, super high mm -hmm. um, quality product. Then you'll yep. kind of have your, your middle, like your just regular ice creams that maybe range between like 12 and 10% fat. Um, those mm -hmm. overruns kind of vary, but typically in the ice cream world, you usually do not see um, high fat with low, low, uh, sorry, with high overrun. Like those okay. kind of contradict because fat itself is so expensive. Right. That's what we're paying a lot. When it comes to ice cream, you're paying a lot for the milk fat, just FYI. Yeah. Milk yep. fat's expensive. So when you see that, you usually will see kind of a haagen -Dazs, So high, high fat, low overrun. When mm -hmm. it comes to, um, again, your economy, 10% fat, you might start seeing more things like current corn syrup in there or, you know, things like that to kind of help bulk up the product to maybe help with the yep. mouthfeel and depends upon kind of how you're using your product. Then you go down into the low fat ice cream, which um, again has a legal definition, your reduced fat ice cream, your, um, let me see, there's low fat, reduced fat, then there's no sugar added. So then you have mm -hmm. ice creams that have no added sugar, but they might have, um, uh, they still have, will have lactose in them. And okay, then you, yeah. so, so whenever, if ever you look at a product and you see something that it looks like ice cream, but it's called frozen dairy dessert, mm -hmm. it's not really ice cream. So they're not hitting the mark somewhere, whether maybe they've added too much whey to it, maybe their overrun's too high, or maybe the milk fat is too low. Um, so yeah. it all just depends. But there's all the gamut of, you know, everything from non-dairy, vegan, to low fat, reduced fat, no sugar added. Yeah standard ice cream, high quality ice cream, rolled ice cream, liquid nitrogen ice cream. Um, mm -hmm. You pretty oh, much somebody name asked it a question there. about liquid nitrogen. Somebody oh, asked, yeah. um, does liquid nitrogen make the smallest ice crystal crystals? Yes. Um, basically because it freezes so fast. So, you know, yeah. when, when it, when it hits, you know, negative 200, whatever, 200 something, um, it hits that liquid nitrogen, it literally forms a sphere like right away. Like, yep. So, dipping dots, ice cream of the future. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, I mean, the ice crystals are so small. But yeah. what you'll see at like Creamistry, or if you're in San Francisco and you've gone to Smitten's Ice Cream, um, or I'm sure there's other places, there's Sub Zero, I know, there's other places out there that do liquid nitrogen ice cream with like the Cuisinart bowls. But oh, that's, yeah. yep. what that's what that's doing is that they're taking. What may or may not be ice cream mix, I'm not sure. To me, mm -hmm. if you're going to freeze that fast, I don't know if you have to have, like, real ice cream. Or, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not right. in that part of the industry. But, but what yeah. I do know um, is that when they pour that liquid in there, they start, you know, using the liquid nitrogen. It's freezing it so incredibly fast. They're, whip, they're trying to whip it to get as much air in there as they can and also not let it stick to the bowl. But if you ever yeah. notice when they're making it, you'll see the liquid nitrogen coming up. Then they take that bowl. They often will put it, will put the bottom of the bowl on something warm, like some hot water or something like that, because it's just so cold. It's literally mm -hmm. so cold. But it'll be... Yeah some of the smoothest ice cream you should have if it's done right, because it literally, there's like zero ice crystals. You right. know what I'm like? Yeah. They're there, but yeah. you could not detect them. Um, yep. Typically by the, on the tongue, the ice crystals have to be 50 microns or more to detect the, the iciness of them. I know that probably okay. means nothing to people, but just FYI in case you want some cool yeah. knowledge of ice cream. <laughs> yeah. Are those the places where, is that where, like, they do those roll, like, the, like, so that's different. In, okay. 
What is so that? Rolled, How are they- rolled ice cream. Yeah. So rolled ice cream is um, taking some type of sugary, milky mixture. Um, I can't yeah. say if it's ice cream mix or not. And they're using um, basically a scraped surface heat exchanger that has been flattened out of a barrel. So okay. you'll, have refriger- you'll have a refrigerant of some sort circulating to keep that pan as co- literally as cold as possible. And yeah. That, that pan that they're pouring the liquid on, just like anything, it's going to start to freeze because there's water in there. Mm-hmm. So it's going to start freezing the water, but there's also yeah. sugar in there. So it's not going to freeze it and literally turn it into a block of ice. It's going right. to freeze it. And then, you know, you start scraping it and, you know, yeah. doing whatever they're doing with it. But notice that ice cream, that ice cream doesn't have like air. Like there's right. no, right. They, yeah. they, they, they flatten it. Yep. It's, um, yeah. It's a, it's a cool thing, yeah. but it's not what we would consider ice right. cream per se to me. Yeah, definitely I love a different texture for sure. Di- totally different texture. Yeah. To me, they tend yep. to be a bit more sticky mm-hmm. um, than creamy itself. Yeah. Um, it also kind of breaks instead of kind of scoops yeah. because yep. you flattened it out. I mean, think about if you right. were to take your ice cream that's in the, refrig- it's in the freezer, let it sit out on the counter pour yeah. it into a baking, a baking dish, a baking pan, put it back in your freezer, you'll kind yeah. of end up with something similar like that because you've depleted yeah. all the air out of it. Um, and then you're literally kind of rolling it up so that it looks a certain way, but it's not, it's not quite real. Right. I can't say if it's real ice cream or not. I don't think it is though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to get cut off here. We've almost been talking for an hour and it. Oh my God. Off, so so fast. I don't want to get cut off, but, um, yeah. So thanks. Thanks again for doing yes. this. This was awesome. Um, yeah. So you can follow Maya at it's at Maya dot Warren, right? Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yep. yep. At Maya dot yeah. Warren. So, yeah. So give her a follow. She does some really cool videos if you want to follow along and make some ice cream with her, but yeah, thanks again. This was, this was great. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Th- and thanks for what you're doing for the for the food science community. And I mean, yeah, when I found definitely. you on on Instagram. I was like, yay, food yeah, science. I know. So, <laughs> so cool. Yeah. So cool. Yeah, awesome. awesome. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs>